Uh, we start with uh, the last uh, educational workshop of today, the workshop in cooperation with immunodiagnostic systems on the use of the aldosterone to renin ratio to identify primary aldosteronism. Um, the discussion, we will make the discussion at the end of the workshop. Um, Professor Morganti doesn't need uh, any presentation. He's, he is professor of internal medicine at the University of Milan, and very expert of the, this uh, field of uh, research. And um, I, I think a, a presentation of the, uh, the workshop, uh, and um, after we, we, uh, we have uh, two different presentations on the specific uh, uh, aspect of this uh, uh, field of research. Professor. Thank you. Okay. Uh, thank you for the introduction, and uh, thank you, of course, to the organizer for inviting me to this symposium about uh, renin and aldosterone testing with the purpose of investigating particularly primary hyperaldosterone. But I would like to spend the few minutes of my presentation talking a little bit more in general about the renin angiotensin system and the aldosterone system because I think it's relevant to understand uh, before all the lab uh, techniques to understand what is the physiology underneath uh, our uh, measurement. Uh, I imagine that uh, all of you are in some way familiar with the renin angiotensin aldosterone system. You know that is a system devoted to the preservation of the volume and pressure homeostasis. And the way the system takes care of volume and pressure is because for whatever change in pressure may occur physiologically or for for whatever depletion of volume which may occur, uh, the just glomerular apparatus, that is a small group of cells located in the afferent renal artery, order, starts to produce, to synthesize and release this enzyme, which is renin, which acts on angiotensinogen, a substrate originated from the uh, liver, generating angiotensin 1. Angiotensin 1 is without action in itself, but is relevant because it's a substrate of another enzyme, converting enzyme, which generates angiotensin 2. Angiotensin 2 is the real effector of the system, which is a potent uh, vasoconstrictor, and by that, of course, it raises blood pressure. In addition to that, also stimulates aldosterone and aldosterone, in turn, is a potent mineral or corticoid hormone which is able to retain sodium and water in the kidney, again expanding the blood volume. So in normal condition, the system is set in such a way that for whatever disruption of the, of the homeostasis of volume and pressure, the system reacts, generating increase in pressure and increase in volume, which extinguish the stimulus which initially uh, activated the system. So this is the way normally the system works. But, but there are conditions, and I mentioned particularly the two first. One is renovascular hypertension, and the other one is primary hyperaldosterone, is the main uh, subject of our talk, in which the uh, system is altered in his way of functioning. And that is very relevant because you see the prevalence of these forms of hypertension, again, renovascular hypertension and primary hyperaldosterone is, are, is around 5 to 10 and 7 to 10 percent. So imagine how many of our patients with hypertension may have this relatively rare form of disease. I uh, calculated just for Italy, but you can easily calculate it on the basis of the, this percentage. What could be in your own country the number of the hypertensive patients who do harbor this kind of uh, disease? Uh, renovascular hypertension is due to 
the restriction to the narrowing of the renal arteries, this is a good example of that, uh, where uh, the, for some reason, either atherosclerosis or fibromuscular dysplasia, there is a, a, a tight narrowing of the uh, renal artery. And because of that, the kidney feels the fall in pressure within the kidney, and it starts generating uh, renin and in turn in generating aldosterone. So going along the same uh, cartoon that I showed you before, in this case, because of the renal artery stenosis, there is a decrease in perfusion pressure in the kidney. There is a stimulation of the renin release, augmentation of angiotensin 1, augmentation of angiotensin 2, and of course, a stimulation of aldosterone, which is under control of angiotensin 2. And because of that, there is an increase in blood volume, there is an increase in vasoconstriction, but the stimulus is not extinguished because the kidney keeps going in producing renin because it feels that the blood pressure is low beyond the stenosis. So why I am mentioning that? I am mentioning that because it is very relevant then to have a measurement of renin and of aldosterone, which are both very elevated in the renovascular hypertension. What does happen in contrast in patients who have primary hyperaldosteronism, either due to an adenoma, like in this case is a bilateral adenoma, or to hyperplasia, as we say. Hyperplasia is when the adrenal are working too much, producing too much aldosterone, but there is no a nodule or, or a clear-cut adenoma, okay? In this case, uh, the uh, situation is just the opposite of what we have seen in renovascular hypertension. Why? Because uh, as a result of increase in aldosterone, primary increase in aldosterone, there is sodium retention, increase in blood volume, increase in blood pressure because of increase in volume, but the perfusion pressure in the kidney is high in contrast to renovascular hypertension where the perfusion pressure is low. And as a result, renin release is shut down, is limited, is suppressed, little of angiotensin 1, little of angiotensin 2, but a lot of aldosterone. So under these circumstances, the combination of the two hormones is high aldo and low renin. And that is very relevant because nowadays the ratio between aldosterone and renin is considered to be the main uh, uh, step for diagnosing primary hyperaldosterone. This is a study that we did in collaboration with Professor Rossi in Padua showing again that if you calculate the ratio between aldosterone as a, a numerator and a, a, and, and renin either measure with a direct assay or with plas as plasma renin activity, this ratio is much, much higher in patients with APA, that is aldosterone producing adenoma or hyperplasia than in patients with essential hypertension. Again, indicating that the two measurements, the two measurements together are crucial to do this kind of diagnosis. So to summarize, uh, to, to find out whether we are dealing with these forms of hypertension, you must measure both uh, renin and aldosterone. And uh, my colleagues uh, in a few minutes will tell you how to do that in detail with the new assay available. But what I want you to recall and to remind is that to make the diagnosis of renovascular hypertension, you must show high renin and high aldo. Whereas for primary hyperaldosteronism, you have low renin, suppressed renin, and a high aldo. That is my main message, but I want just to conclude saying that the measurement of renin are also very useful for other aspects of uh, diagnosis and treatment of uh, hypertension, also in patients uh, with essential hypertension, not secondary forms of hypertension like the one I just told you because are useful for the stratification of cardiovascular risk and for uh, selecting the proper, the best possible 
antihypertensive treatment uh, for a patient with essential hypertension. I don't have time to go into details about that, but in uh, the discussion, if somebody is interested in this issue, I will be very glad to cover it. So thank you very much. I hope I stayed in my time, the time which was allocated to me, and I pass the word to the subsequent uh, speaker. Please, Dr. Fortunat, please. Thanks uh, who organized this workshop and invited me to speak about analytical aspects of assays used for the diagnostic of uh, hypertension. In the diagnostic uh, uh, of uh, hypertension, we found, as Professor Morganti said, two important actors, two, two leading actors that are renin and aldosterone. The problem from the analytical point of view is that is, uh, these two molecules are completely different for, for uh, the structure. We have a steroid and a protein. So for the protein, we now have methods that simply uh, can detect this uh, kind of molecules. But on, uh, for aldosterone, we have a lot of problems. And, For aldosterone, we this year celebrated the 60th anniversary of this uh, uh, investigation because it was a molecule that uh, uh, since uh, the 50s was uh, uh, detected as an important uh, factor of uh, uh, hypertension. Also, if uh, uh, adrenal gland was studied from the uh, five centuries ago. And, uh, the problem, the analytical problem of aldosterone is based on, on many uh, aspects. Uh, one of this is uh, the wide range of concentration we have to detect because in normal subjects we have very low values, but in uh, neoplastic uh, pathology we have very, very high uh, concentration of aldosterone. So we have a wide range. Analytical methods available since uh, 50s were at the first uh, just some bioassays and uh, 20 years after in the 70s we had the first uh, immunoassays and uh, until now the best uh, method to detect aldosterone is uh, immunoassay but uh, we, we, if you see there was, uh, there was uh, just uh, one method at the beginning of the, uh, 2002 that was available but just for a few years with an uh, automated chemiluminescence method. And uh, uh, subsequently, uh, uh, the spectrometry, uh, mass spectrometry, is uh, indicated as uh, the best method to measure aldosterone. Also, if we have to know that this kind of method in our lab are not so widely applicable. Applicable. And last year we had the possibility to have another method, automated method in immunochemical machines that can be used to detect aldosterone. The problem of the detection of aldosterone with the immune assay is the characteristic problems of steroid measurement. We have a problem of specificity and a problem of sensitivity. Specificity because we have a molecule that is present among a lot of other molecules, very similar from the molecular point of view, but in very different concentration. In a sample of blood, we can have different steroids that are present in very different concentration. We then doesn't think, take care that uh, uh, glucose is uh, 100 million more than aldosterone, but w what we have to note is that cortisol is 10,000 10, more concentrated than aldosterone. So this is a great problem because the two molecules are very, very similar. So when we have to approach to an immunosay, we need a very specific antibody to use. 
And the problem of measurement of aldosterone is shown by this uh, uh, quality assessment scheme. This is an uh, Italian uh, assessment scheme where you can see that three different RIA radioimmunoassay uh, methods gives completely different uh, results and also the precision is of the measurement is very important problem. It's a very important problem also if the concentration is not so low in this sample of, of um, quality uh, control. And when we had the, pro the possibility to test uh, the uh, aldosterone and the renin with the, with the new and automated system, the first thing we, we looked at was the specificity of the antibody for the problem of the, uh, to detect really aldosterone. And this is the table of cross-reactivity of natural and uh, synthetic steroids that could be present in a, a blood sample. And the calibration curve used in uh, this test is, uh, is a, a, has a good slope, so we have uh, a, a enough linearity and sensitivity of the test. But what we would want to say is that in our experience, this is a, a linearity uh, test, so we diluted some samples, many folds, and you can see the correlation between expected values and observed values is very linear and the slope is 1.0. So this means that we are measuring really aldosterone and not other steroids. The other thing is the precision of uh, the measurement, where you can see both uh, intra-assay and intra-assay uh, CV are uh, acceptable, both for control material and for uh, sa um, samples from patients. So you know that when you use control materials, you can't have not real uh, results, but it is important to have good results of precision using uh, patient uh, plasma samples. And the other thing is what, what is the results obtained against other method, immunoassay methods available. These are uh, the comparison of uh, the immunoassay automated in chemical immunizations with the two radioimmunoassay, the, uh, more, the most uh, um, frequently used in our lab, that is the Siemens, it means DPC uh, RIA, called tube, and this is uh, the uh, aldosterone from uh, the Asori. And this multiploid show against the Siemens that is uh, took as a reference because it is considering as a reference uh, also in the States. Uh, you see that the results obtained with uh, ISIS is very close to zero as a difference. Instead, the, uh, the Asoni gives lower results. In fact, you have also in this box part, uh, you see that the Asoni is uh, higher, and also in the before in uh, the quality control scheme, you, you saw that uh, uh, the assorting was higher in value. So this means that uh, ISIS is, uh, gives uh, results uh, in the middle between the two radio assays. And these are the details of the, the data obtained. This is uh, the comparison from, with uh, DPC with uh, ISIS. Uh, you see you have a uh, an overestimation with a slope of 1.2. Instead, uh, against uh, uh, the Asorin radioimmunoassay, you have a slope of 0.8. So the two slope is a little bit different, but the correlation with the two system is uh, good. And this is uh, in our experience recently. We uh, made uh, a study on 21 subjects, healthy subjects, volunteers, that had normal pressure, no drugs, assumption, no history of hypertension, and we performed the test in uh, two uh, way after two hours working, so to have the standing uh, um, values of the higher uh, concentration of uh, aldosterone, and a supine test after one hour of lying in a bed. 
So you see that this uh, um, difference uh, from uh, uh, the two positions are clearly uh, marked from uh, the two systems, both radium monoassay and uh, um, ISIS. And also, this means that with radium monoassay, this is the Viasorin radium monoassay, we have higher uh, results in respect to ISIS. But uh, what we had, uh, the confirmation of our result obtained was a result obtained in other in, uh, labs where they compared both uh, as us to radium monoassay of uh, DPC and uh, diasorin, and we had the same uh, slopes higher for comparison to uh, DPC and lower with diasorin. Uh, but this uh, lab compared also the uh, result obtained with the ISIS to LCMS. So this is very comfortable because you see that the slope is 1.0, so it means that with the ISIS they obtained the same results of uh, LCMS. Other uh, test we performed was uh, in uh, urine test because we think that it could be a good information to have the medium uh, secretion of aldosterone in uh, the 24 hours uh, urine. And this is our protocol we use normally for uh, the hydrolysis of the urine uh, samples with uh, a uh, dilution in uh, a um, correct uh, medium to have uh, the measure of uh, aldosterone in urine. And uh, this is our experience in comparison to radium assay of diasorin. And you see that we have, uh, again, an overestimation of diasorin, uh, uh, but we have uh, a good correlation. And also for urine, we have a very good uh, um, precision between uh, RAN and uh, within RAN. For RANIN, uh, uh, as I said before, uh, we have uh, uh, lo less problems because we are measuring a protein, so instead of a competitive assay, we can use a sandwich assay, so the specificity of uh, the, the system is uh, greater, and uh, also in this case we have a very good linearity test and a good uh, level of sensitivity. Our LAOQ was 4.6 micro units per ml. And also for RENIN, we found a good precision within and inter assay. You see, the CV values are uh, very low. And this is uh, the comparison with the two uh, you mainly use the, the system of, to measure Renin, uh, direct uh, Renin, that is uh, the liaison immunochemistry uh, uh, system, automated system, and the manual uh, is BIOS, it is a radium monoassay. And you see, against the IDS, we have a very good correlation. This is uh, the, the uh, equality line. So you see that the two systems are very, very comparable. But some discussion with pro probably with Professor Morganti is about it, if we have measure renin or plasma renin activity. The two things are, are different from the conceptual point of view because with the direct renin we are measuring the protein. In uh, uh, PRA we are measuring an an enzyme activity, so are two different uh, situations, but if we compare the result for the same samples, we have more than 100 uh, samples uh, detected, we, you see that there is a, a good correlation also if the numbers are completely different for that reason. And also at very low levels we have uh, a good uh, correlation. What is important for Renin is uh, also the stability in, of the sample, and uh, these uh, are data from 
IDS that uh, are uh, trying to, to see what is uh, the stability of, of a sample on board at, at uh, um, room temperature or uh, freeze uh, with uh, different cycles of tow and freeze. And uh, you see that there are uh, very good correlations between the, the, all uh, the samples. So also the stability of the uh, renin, that is one of the problems, I think, uh, of the measure of uh, plasma renin activity instead of the stability of the sample is uh, uh, with this system very, very uh, good. And in conclusion, we found using the automated uh, IDS uh, system for uh, detect uh, aldosterone and the renin, we, good, uh, we found a good stability uh, and also the reduced the turnaround time you need uh, to have uh, the results could uh, give us a very significant improvement in the use of aldosterone and renin in uh, the diagnosis of hypertension. I thank you very much for your attention. And yes, today I'd like to share with you our uh, one-year experience on the measurement of plasma aldosterone and plasma renin ratio on the automated analyzer uh, of IDS using the two um, new chemiluminescence immunoassays. So I'd like to tell you a bit about the um, intermethod variability of aldosterone and renin assays because it plays a major role in the aldosterone to renin ratio cutoffs and uh, show you some of our recent correlation data uh, from various labs around the world and also to tell you a bit about the AR and the, uh, the cutoffs which are available and show you our um, ISIS specific uh, ARR cutoff data and also ISIS specific uh, sodium suppression test cutoff data which we've collected over the past year. So um, we heard a lot about the background already of uh, hyperaldosteronism, but um, why do we want to measure the aldosterone to renin ratio? Because um, we know that uh, primary aldosteronism is the uh, most common secondary cause um, uh, uh, of resistant hypertension, uh, which is diagnosed um, in uh, the clinic. So um, the prevalence um, in uh, unselected hypertensive patients can be between 5 to 15 percent, depending on the, the study that you look at, but also um, in um, patients with resistant or severe hypertension, it can be more than uh, 22 percent. So uh, the ARR is a stronger predictor of uh, the increase in blood pressure uh, and associated with hypertension than aldosterone or renin alone. And the uh, JCNM guidelines um, suggest uh, detecting primary aldosteronism by using the ARR in such an algorithm um, in patients with a high likelihood of primary aldosteronism. So uh, detection, confirmatory testing, and then a subtype uh, diagnosis. So um, the confusion can then occur because uh, the guidelines suggest many different cutoffs, and this is dependent on um, whether aldosterone is measured in different units and how renin is measured. So in addition to the great variability between different assays for aldosterone and renin, um, we also have the additional source of confusion, which is uh, in the units, if aldosterone is measured in nanograms per deciliter, picograms per ml, uh, picomoles per liter, and then if we're measuring renin activity, uh, which is something different to renin concentration, as uh, speakers before me uh, said, so if we're measuring the production of angiotensin 1 in nanogram per, ml per hour or picomoles per liter per minute, or if we're measuring renin then concentration in milli units per liter or in then mass units. So you can see the numbers really vary um, a great deal, and so great caution should be taken when interpreting these cutoffs um, uh, and the assays that you're using. So um, what does this variability then look like between the assays? 
Um, I wanted to show you the example of uh, the Reference Institute for Bioanalytics in Bonn in Germany. And um, this is the survey of the fourth quarter of 2012. And you can see it here in these uh, what are called Juden plots. Um, so each one of these dots represents um, a laboratory that's taken part in this survey. And aldosterone is really one of the worst um, analytes in the scheme for uh, with, between laboratory precision. You can see that it's 39% here for the A sample and 24% for the B sample. So each lab is receiving two samples, and here it's a plot of what they got for the A and the B sample. So you can see the variability is large, and uh, for example, here's the Siemens RIA, which is, uh, as we heard, uh, one of the market leaders. This is the target, and uh, the ranges are in this uh, box. So you can see that the Siemens RIA is uh, quite well in the target, but look at how big the difference is, for example, to the Beckman Coulter RIA, which um, is measuring a lot higher, and also is often not inside the target. But uh, I think what's also very interesting to see from this survey is that there's even differences in mass spectrometry, which is something quite un unexpected as we um, consider that mass spectrometry is a gold standard, but uh, actually there's also differences in, in the calibration of the various uh, mass spec systems. So um, at this time, the ISIS assay was still quite new. There's only four labs, but um, they are quite well on the target so far. So the ISIS aldosterone assay is calibrated against um, the, the standards that are used are calibrated against the Reference Institute for Bioanalytics. And here, um, you saw this graph earlier uh, from Professor Fortunato, but uh, we've measured a large series of their samples from uh, various surveys uh, and also some lower samples, which um, they've measured especially for IDS, so we can see what is going on in the lower range. So we have a very good slope and R squared. And here, uh, I wanted to show you some correlation from some other labs around the world. For example, a lab in Vienna who is using the Siemens RIA. And they also have a very good uh, slope and correlation in 83 samples that they measured. Uh, also, a lab in Sydney, Australia, using the Diosaurin aldo k assay um, has a good correlation. But as we saw in the previous speaker as well, the slope is um, quite different because the ISIS is measuring um, a lot lower than the Diosaurin CTK. So uh, recently at IDS, we've completed a study with uh, a larger set of EDTA plasma samples against uh, a mass spectrometry method by Daniel Holmes in uh, Vancouver, Canada. So we wanted to see in a more extended set of samples what does the uh, ISIS look like compared to mass spectrometry, which is uh, very important. So we had a very good correlation and slope to this um, LCMS method. Um, good correlation does not always mean a good agreement, so we also like to look at the difference or bland altman plots where you can see the uh, difference between the two assays is evenly distributed around the mean mark but uh, the ISIS is measuring uh, approximately 10% higher than this LCMS method, which is not um, necessarily unexpected, considering what we saw that um, different mass spec methods also have differences in calibration. So if we move on to uh, direct renin concentration, immediately you can see in the same uh, survey again that uh, concentrations are, um, uh, of CVs are a lot lower, so the picture in general is much better for renin assays. Um, here you can see the diosaurin liaison and compared to the cis-bio immunoradiometric assay, um, the two assays are very comparable. And uh, also again the four labs uh, using the ISIS assay. And this is very important because, uh, because of the mathematical um, nature of the ARR, uh, which is very much dependent on renin, it's very important that renin is um, consistently measured, and also because uh, in primary aldosteronism, as we heard, the concentrations of renin are very low. So I wanted to show you the correlation um, in a set of samples from Munich in 240 EDTA plasma samples uh, against the liaison renin, which is currently used in the lab in Munich. Um, this is from a cohort of the uh, routine diagnostic in the lab in Munich, and including also a lot of uh, very low samples from the patients from the CON registry. And here I just uh, log transform the data so you can see a little bit uh, closer in uh, the low range how the correlation looks. And uh, we had a very uh, good agreement, uh, the ISIS measuring a little bit lower than the diasaurin. 
So um, plasma renin activity is often considered a gold standard, so it's good to have a good agreement uh, of renin concentration to plasma renin activity. It's not, we're not measuring the same thing, so it's not necessarily expected that the correlation will be good because from the one hand we're measuring uh, uh, the renin concentration itself and on the other hand we're measuring how much angiotensin 1 is produced. But nonetheless, we had um, a good agreement um, in, uh, from samples from a lab in Australia, in Sydney, and also from Vancouver, Canada, um, from another uh, PRA method which has been published in JCNM. So we had a good, uh, very good um, agreement in uh, slope and correlation with these two PRA methods. So uh, to move on to the screening for primary aldosteronism using these two um, ISIS assays, what have we found in the past year? As I said earlier, um, the ARR is a stronger predictor of uh, primary aldosteronism than uh, uh, aldosterone and renin alone. And you can see from this uh, paper published in Clinical Chemistry in 2004 that uh, if you look at the um, discrimination of aldosterone or PRA or plasma renin concentration alone in um, healthy and primary aldosteronism patients, then you can see there is um, a large overlap in all uh, these parameters. However, if you then look at the ARR, you will see that uh, the separation is much better. Of course, here the discriminatory power of the ARR is um, exaggerated because this um, comparison is done in healthy versus primary aldosteronism patients, and of course that will never be the case in the clinic, so what um, should really be made is a comparison between primary aldosteronism and essential hypertensive patients. And this is, in fact is what we have done uh, to uh, look at the ISIS assays. We've um, uh, done the clinical validation in uh, Dr. Bittlingmeier's lab in Munich. Um, we've looked at primary aldosteronism patients and essential hypertensives. The aldosteronism patients were from a selection of the CON uh, registry, the German CON registry, uh, whereby these patients are defined with an ARR cutoff greater than 1.2. This is the cutoff uh, used in the lab in Munich uh, with the two uh, assays, Siemens aldosterone and the liaison renin. It's a little bit lower than uh, what the guidelines suggest um, as a cutoff with these units which was around 2.4 until uh, up to 5, roughly. Um, so this cutoff was actually determined uh, as part of a retrospective study looking at the German con registry uh, population. So the primary aldosteronism uh, is defined by a post-saline load of aldosterone greater than 5 nanograms per deciliter. Uh, Beta blockers were excluded from the patients um, at the time that the sampling was made. Mineralocorticoid receptor antagonists were excluded and hypokalemia was corrected. Uh, and in most of the cases, uh, diuretics were excluded as well. So uh, AVS, adrenal vein sampling, and CT scans were uh, also used to confirm or exclude lateralization. For the essential hypertensive cohort, um, the, the patients had uh, three independent elevated blood pressure measurements, and most of them had also 24-hour blood pressure as they were admitted to the hospital, uh, so they were not only um, checked by a GP. And then other causes were excluded as much as possible according to the standardized protocol of the clinic. So what did we do to try and determine the ARR uh, for the ISIS, aldosterone ISIS renin assays? We um, had a selection of primary aldosteronism and essential hypertensive patients who were um, defined uh, uh, according to the cutoff used in Munich, again with Siemens and uh, Diasorin, of 1.2. And we've also uh, just shown here a, a group of healthy patients. Um, just for comparison, they were not used to define the cutoff. What we want to look at is uh, what cutoff then should be used for the ISIS assays in order to get the same sensitivity and specificity as we currently have with Siemens and Diasorin combination, and what is the most appropriate cutoff. So um, we uh, have put this data into the receiver operating characteristics curve to check, and we can see that at uh, an aldosterone to renin ratio greater than 0 0.89, 
we get a sensitivity of 95.7% and a specificity of uh, 83%, which is uh, very similar to, the, to that found with the commonly used um, assays in the lab. And of course, because uh, the ARR is a screening test and we require um, the highest possible sensitivity so that as many as possible uh, potential primary discerners and patients can be found, um, the cutoff now for the two ISIS assays should be lowered to 0 0.9 from uh, before it was 1.2 with Siemens and Dysorin. So um, finally, I wanted to show you uh, some of the um, confirmatory testing data, which in Munich is the uh, post-saline infusion four hours uh, level, which follows the ARR uh, screening. So it's also well known that during dynamic testing, um, there's a lot of differences between different assays. So um, this also has to be taken into account. Uh, you can see in this uh, paper, which was published by Dr. Bittenmeyer's uh, group a few years ago, that um, in healthy and in essential hypertensives in con patients, the levels are different during the suppression test um, using different assays. So the test, the cutoff is 50 in Munich, for example, but this of course would not work if you're using uh, the adultus assay or the, for example, the DSL assay. So once again, cutoffs are only assay specific and for every uh, new test, the new cutoff should be determined. Uh, this is what we did, um, again, with uh, samples from, uh, from Munich Laboratory. Um, we've looked at con patients uh, uh, who were um, not suppressed using the Siemens RIA. They all had levels above uh, 5. Here it's nanograms per deciliter. Uh, and we've also measured those samples on the IDS ISIS aldosterone assay. So you can see preload, postload, um, all the levels are above 5. Similarly, um, looking at the non-con, so essential hypertensives who were confirmed not to have primary aldosteronism, um, in all of these guys, uh, the levels are below five. There were a couple of cases here who were not. But the data here now suggests that the cutoff for the um, post-sodium load suppression test will uh, remain at five nanograms per liter, uh, per deciliter, using the IDS ISIS aldosterone assay. Uh, in summary, um, method-dependent concentrations for both aldosterone and renin uh, still remain a problem, uh, more so for aldosterone, so caution should be used in the cutoffs uh, which are applied from the literature. The correlation of both assays to existing methods and to gold standard reference methods uh, was very good so far. Um, and the new automated assay combinations will allow a meaningful diagnosis uh, of primary aldosteronism with comparable specificity and sensitivity to those currently used. A uh, slightly lower cutoff for the ARR should be applied at 0 0.9 when we are talking about nanograms per deciliter and microunits per ml. Uh, and we will get similar sensitivity and specificity. The same cutoff for the aldosterone uh, post-saline infusion test at five nanograms per deciliter uh, will be used. So uh, that will be less than five in healthy subjects. And that's all, thanks for your attention. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Manolopoulos. Do, do you mind joining us and Dr. Fortunato too, so that we can have uh, at least uh, 10 minutes of nice discussion. So there is plenty of time for discussion. I think it's very, very relevant because this kind of thing are uh, extremely important for the correct diagnosis. So please uh, come up your, with your question, pose your question. I can't believe if you are interested in this field that there are no questions. Maybe one, no? Please. Thank you for your talk. Uh, just a general question regarding uh, using of this to uh, renin and the aldosterone ratio. Will be difference if we use uh, aldosterone from one manufacturer and use 
Renault from another manufacturer? Will it be different, uh, or should we be in with one manufacturer platform? Yanni? I would say that, of course, it's easier if you use the same platform because then you have advantages, like you can use just one uh, sample tube and you will have um, use of less volume, compared volumes, and so on. But the important thing is that for every combination, the cutoff has to be um, established for your testing system. So this is, the, we did a large study with a lot of samples for the two aldosterone assays, uh, for the two ISIS assays on this automated platform. But as you saw from my data, for example, at the moment, because there was no aldosterone automated assay in Munich, they were using Siemens RA and the liaison uh, Renin. So it's possible, but the cutoffs have to be established uh, properly and preferably in your lab with a cohort from your population. <laughs> One more question. Hi, Jenny. I wonder if I could ask you a question about your rock curves. Yeah. Normally, when one uses rock curves, it tells you about the sensitivity and specificity of a test for a patient in front of you. So what you want to do is to have a proportion of patients with disease and non-disease in the right proportion that they come in through the front door. So we heard earlier in the, the talk that 10% of patients have primary hyperaldosteronism, roughly, out of a total collection. So if you calculate your rock curves for, this for the ARR for using 10% of your total cohort rather than 30% of your total cohort, what does the precision look like then? Because that's what I really want to know when I'm in clinic. All right. <laughs> Speaking of the microphone. Yeah. I mean, we, when we started off, we had a lot uh, fewer uh, con patients, and actually the ratio or the, the where the cutoff should stand does not really change. So we tried to include as many patients as possible because we thought that's better to really get a, the best you know, idea of what the cutoff should be. So um, I guess we can look at the data again, but actually, from what I remember, because we did this over the past year, even in the beginning when we had fewer con patients included, the ratio didn't really change. Right. Or no. the cutoff, where the cutoff should be, didn't really change. I wasn't challenging your cutoff point, because that's made mm. by knowing what the diagnosis afterwards is. Yeah. I mean, you were saying that you, were, you had a very good, your rock curve clings up around the corner, yeah. looking very good. I wonder what, per what percentage of the area under that curve would be if you looked at 10% rather than 30%? Because I suspect your, the, 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 uh, the performance, that area under the curve, will drop quite a lot when you look at patients in the right proportion. Yeah, maybe, but this is to actually establish the cutoff, so. If we, I have got correctly your question, you are wondering whether working with the 10% prevalence, where you are getting the same nice curve that you get of course, with a much higher prevalence uh, examining in the study that Jenny presented. That is your point, no? Did I get it? Yeah, so for sure, that is something which must be checked. Uh, that is a very relevant point. Other question? Yes, I was just wondering if you um, have calculated the um, cutoff in SI units and what they would be, what that cutoff would be, like using different units. I uh, mean, like for aldosterone in picomole mm -hmm. or so. Um, yeah, I have not, but it's a simple mathematical calculation which you can just do to convert from nanogram to picomole um, times 27.7 or whatever it is. Okay, you don't have it. Okay. <laughs> um, so, yeah. okay. That is something you must pay attention to because that is also true for renin, for instance, Jenny mentioned nanogram uh, per the liter or the deciliter, whereas usually renin is expressed in picogram per ml, and that was not mentioned, but again, that can be a source of error too. Uh, may I raise one, uh, one issue that I think is relevant? Uh, oh, maybe there is a, a question for the audience. Please, go on. Is the time stand, uh, standardized for supine position and all? You said to, uh, one hour uh, sleeping. I'm, I'm sorry, what was this, supine? Yeah, supine. Uh, for, for which part? For aldosterone collection and all, sample collection. 
they were in the seating position. You mean, yeah, seating position. Yes. Seating for position two hours. is for one hour. I think it's two hours. And standing is for two hours. Yeah, I think they should be standing and then sitting quietly for two hours, something like this. Or are you talking about Dr. Fortunato's data where it's standing? About the, from the first speaker or from no, my, from you only, you from my data? Only. Yeah. From my data, it's uh, two hours. Oh. Yeah. You see, the, the point that you raised is very relevant uh, from a, a physiological point of view. Because, of course, uh, you are thinking that uh, it may be quite, quite different in studying patient in the sitting or supine or standing position. That is a, it has been a matter of discussion for years. Uh, we have been looking to that problem uh, in, in detail recently and found that, after all, there is not that much different if you calculate the aldosterone renin ratio in supine or standing position. Because uh, in respective of the different uh, condition patient studies, aldosterone almost always goes up during standing. And surprising, surprisingly, that occurs also when patients are on treatment with ACE inhibitors, ARBs, or beta blockers. That is particularly surprising because these drugs are considered to be able to block the response of aldosterone to, uh, to, to standing. And that is not the case. So I would recommend from, to check in your own lab what is the difference in these different position? Because that may simplify very much the way of collecting the blood in these patients. Because otherwise it would be very difficult to do, to translate the data of one lab to the other lab. And to clarify this point is of great, great relevance for the practical use of this uh, aldosterone renin ratio. Sitting position is now considered to be the position to be used, but again, there are a number of labs where the blood is collected in supine position or standing right away. Standing may be misleading because you don't never know exactly how much the patient actually st stood up. And you know how it is difficult in common lab to have also the facilities to have a patient lying down or standing up. So, that is a major problem. Please. Hello, my name is Siegfried Stradnitz from Switzerland. I've got a question. When you compared uh, the AR performed by different methods, <clears throat> I'm sure most likely you got um, discrepant results at some level. <clears throat> uh, my question is, did you match them with the clinic? And are those data published or available? So you probably got um, with um, an ARR um, which you got by one method and an ARR which you got by different method, the ISIS, for example. You got, I'm sure you got most likely distracted results for some cases. Mm -hmm. Did you match them with the clinic? Um, we did have for some samples, um, but uh, a lot of the time it's not always possible to exclude all medication that the patients are on. So um, really for this study, we only, we, we try to exclude any discrepant samples because we're trying to set up the cutoff and we really tried to only inc include patients who were not on any medication, but we did see um, some discrepant things and most likely they are because the diagnosis is not finally confirmed or because they are on some kind of medication. So. Maybe the, the patient history isn't exactly known, and so on. So, yeah, we did see some discrepant, but in this study, for the cutoff, we only included uh, results where we are definite that they should be included. Please. What do you think about the possibility to use a saliva screening tool? <laughs> I think saliva is interesting and it's really non-invasive and I, um, I made a saliva assay for my PhD a few years ago, so, um, <laughs> okay, yeah, I think it's an interesting tool and saliva is very stable and easy to collect and there's a good correlation with plasma because um, aldosterone is present in very high levels as a free steroid, like as opposed to cortisol. So um, I think it's a really interesting study and you know, we should maybe think about doing that. 
yeah. Saliva, I think, uh, need uh, some uh, change in the, in the measurement, uh, in the method. Yeah, the levels are lower. They're about 30% of that found in plasma. So maybe the sensitivity has to be improved a little bit <laughs> for that. But, uh, but in primary obstetricism, they will be high anyway. So. We have still a few more minutes to discuss. Dr. Fortunato, uh, you showed the uh, comparison between uh, the direct renin assay and the plasma renin activity. And uh, you, you showed that uh, in uh, the low range of these values, the relationship is not that good. Uh, or it's not at least as good as it is in the medium-high level. Uh, do you have an idea why the sensitivity in uh, this assay tends to be maybe a little bit less good in the low range rather than in the medium or high range? Uh, is there any evidence that uh, the activation of proinin may play a role in that? I think this is uh, <laughs> an old question with clinicians because uh, uh, for us in lab uh, is, uh, the, to detect the renin at very low levels with uh, new methods is very simple and also we have the possibility with a sandwich uh, architecture of the say to go to very 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 low uh, uh, concentration. The problem is uh, that for uh, raining, uh, direct raining measurement, we showed some data about stability of the sample. I don't think the same can be showed for uh, uh, plasma renin activity. And also, what we used was a standard uh, procedure to detect uh, raining. We don't have uh, more, uh, a, lo uh, a longer time of incubation to see lower levels of plasma renin activity as normally some uh, specialistic uh, labs do to see very, very low levels. So I think that from the analytical point of view, the data obtained for direct renin at low levels are more precise than when we measure direct uh, plasma renin activity with a standard timing of incubation, standard procedure of managing the sample. That's one, one final question for both of you, because I think that people must leave the room with a clear idea about that. And it is what your suggestion, what is your suggestion for blood collection for those renin and aldosterone, keep in ice, as it was suggested in the old days, or keep at room temperature. That is relevant because, again, it has to do with the activation of chlorine, which is when uh, blood is exposed to low temperature, it can really uh, activate chlorine and therefore increase the level of both plasma renin activity and direct renin. And what are the suggestions in your essay? If, uh, somebody is going to work with that, what uh, kind of uh, recommendation should he follow? I would say that if they don't have the possibility to deep freeze directly the samples, then um, room temperature is the best. And aldosterone and renin are both very stable at room temperature for at least sort of a day, so room temperature. You share the same yes. recommendation? Okay. It's important to use uh, EDTA plasma uh, because uh, uh, you use the same sample for both the tests and also the turnaround time is, is so uh, short that you can run very quickly in a, an automated system both the tests so you don't need to store and so just in few hours you have re results. So Okay, then, if there are no further questions, thank you everybody for attending uh, this nice workshop, and I wish you the best for the evening. Okay, enjoy Milan. <laughs>